Hey everybody, this is John Fred Young from the band Blackstone Cherry, and we're rocking on the airwaves on Backbeat. All music is the same. It's just a new set of lyrics and a new Backbeat. Well, John Fred, thanks a lot for taking time out of uh, your busy schedule to have a chat. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right. What was the catalyst that made you guys decide to want to record your next album with Howard Benson? Yeah, Howard was he was great to work with. Um, we had a really good time doing that record because we you know we were out in California writing some songs and and uh, writing with a guy named Dave Bassett, who's a really good friend of ours now, and he we you know went out a couple of times to write with him, and the label wanted us to uh, stop by and talk to Howard because they really felt like they wanted us to do the album with him because they want they wanted our record to you know be more radio rock formatted you know because a lot of the, you know, our previous albums are kind of unchained rock and roll if you know what i'm saying like it's kind of like straight ahead yeah straight ahead and um this is a really straight ahead album too but i think that the system that howard benson and the system that um chris lord alge have to to mix things i think it's really good because i mean chris lord alge has mixed so many big big records and mm -hmm. together they have a great team so for us it was nice to uh to get to work with those guys and, and see how they do producing and, and do mixing and uh, it was it was cool I mean we went in for about a week pre rehearsal and then uh, there was probably I think we did the drums in two days and then we did guitars for about a week and a half and then we we left went home for Christmas came back and finished up the guitars and then Howard came in for the vocals he he really wasn't there for the guitars and bass he was just there for drums and vocals mm -hmm. he was like you guys do what you want to do on that stuff so we were like all right, cool. So he was up up my butt the whole time about you know playing the beats right and stuff like that. So, but it has to be right. So it was yeah, it was fun working with him. Good dude, uh, really mm -hmm. good team. Mike Plotnikoff was an engineer on uh, on the album. So that was you know he's done a lot of really nice records too, and just a, a really good team out there. It was fun. We had a good time making this record. For Zepp's third album, they went to a cottage in the country. Now you guys essentially have done that since day one. And now you've turned the tables by recording in L.A. Mm -hmm. And it reflections on that. Um, it was it was kind of it was just different living out there. I mean, it was the four of us were living in apartments, and uh, it was fun. We had a good time, you know, doing it. It, it definitely our first record we did at home, and my dad uh, Richard Young, who also he, he plays with a group called Kentucky Headhunters, right. and uh, he he produced our first album, and uh, so. The the thing was it was pretty it was pretty cool getting your dad to you know help you with your first album and then like you our second album was with uh, Bob Marlette and that was that was pretty cool we we did that down in Nashville but um I don't think it really matters where we record anymore it's just as long as we get good takes and you know it's I mean it's cool to like say you've recorded in a castle and like you've recorded you know you can make a great rock record in your bedroom now. <laughs> <laughs> These you days, I mean? yeah, yeah. I mean, back in the day, like, you know, I, I think it would still be nice to to do some things like that, you know. But I think, you know, so many good records are being made in, in basements and garages and things like that. So, mm -hmm. but you guys left familiar territory for unfamiliar territory. Right. Did, did that influence the the album? I guess it must have been influenced in some way. It influenced some of the writing because we this was the first record we actually did with outside writers. Yeah. You had you had quite a bit of help with the writing. Uh, how did it widen the band's horizons? Um, I think it made us. At first, we didn't want to do it because we wanted to. You know, we, we were afraid that maybe our style of writing mm -hmm. would be hindered by somebody else coming in. But I think it just brought a new brain into it. You know, a new mind, and it was it was fun. It was easy. Um, of course, you know, some of the rights didn't go as well as some of the others. Some of the rights were like, oh man, that's the hit song, you know? So I mean, it's just, you roll the dice every time. And we made a lot of good friends out of it. But I think a couple of the, the songs we had written with um, Dave Bassett, who's out in Malibu, California, I think that those songs wouldn't, have, we might not have written some of those songs, you know, if we just stayed at the Prax House in Kentucky. But, you know, you got songs on there too, like Boom Boom, but we wrote that by ourselves, you know? It's just different. I mean, sometimes you need help. 
sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's better if people just stay away, <laughs> you know. But we, we had a really good time writing with those guys. Yeah, and sometimes just a little nudge. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we need a referee. Sometimes uh-huh. we need somebody to, like, harness our energy where, you know, to keep us from going too far over here, just keep us that way. Keep so, you on track. Yeah, we had, had a good time. Though. Uh-huh. Now, I have a hard time finding a bad track on the album. Thank you. Thank you very much. The third album is the one that defines the band as to where their place is in the music world. Now, where would you say that would be for you guys? I have no idea. As far as the genre, I, I can't. I, I, I think there's so many people that like, man, y'all are a great southern rock band. You, you, I mean, I know in England, like, we get put in the metal section. No like, kidding. Yeah. Like, our album debuted number one over there, both times, but for folklore and um, for the devil. Uh-huh. And so, it, it's just... It's wild because like in the states, like we're we're known as like you know the southern metal, hard rock, but like we've got ballads too. You know what I'm saying? So I think we're just we're just a really I think just an American rock band that's been influenced by so many different genres of music that we're we're kind of just doing our own thing. <laughs> I guess I, I find it hard to picture you guys in a in a heavy metal section. Oh really? I don't see it. Yeah, I think it's I think it's the live show uh-huh. a lot of the time. Yeah, people think that obviously our, our live performance is very metal driven. We try to write songs that they're either you know really energetic or they're really heartfelt. You know, mm-hmm. even like the ballads, like we don't really even like writing the syrupy stuff. And I think that we've we've done good to not write mm-hmm. too many syrupy songs. If it's going to be a ballad, it needs to be something genuine or true to the heart. So. It's it's different. Like for you, you're like, why would you guys be metal? I don't know. Why would we be <laughs> considered southern rock just because we're from Kentucky? I, True. I don't know. You know what? As long as people like the music, they can call us wherever they want. Whatever they that's want. Great. Rock and roll, southern rock, metal. Call me whatever you want. Just so don't call me late for dinner. Yeah, that's right. In America, they don't have the live shows like they do here. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't. It's different, man. It's like there's in in America, rock radio like it. Depicts how you how you play, where where you play on festivals and stuff, and like here in Europe and in the UK, you just if you're a if you're a badass live band and you have great songs, you're gonna go. It's different though. I mean here like there's there's fans come because of the live music. Like we do good mm-hmm. on rock radio in America, but we obviously are doing bigger shows here just because we're a live rock and roll band. ACDC's music is one of the first bands that, that you guys learned to play on an instrument. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, that was me. I, yeah. My uncle had Back in Black, and I remember being just a, a little kid, and uh, um, it was it was just cool. Like he, he was like, here, he was like, learn this album. And I was like, okay. So I sat on my, my uh, side of my bedroom wall, and I beat the plaster off the, the chimney. So, yeah. So. Mom was real pissed off at me, but I remember playing Hell's Bells and Back in Black, so yeah, it was pretty cool. They have some of the greatest riffs and no-nonsense style of music. Now, I get that feeling with uh, Blackstone Cherry's music. It's, I think so. I mean, yeah. I, there's definitely some nonsense, but but um, I, I think that for the most part, our, our writing, you know, I, I think in the early days, like, we tried to write as far as the guitar riffs and, and bass riffs went. It was like it had to be the most complicated, hard ass thing to follow. But I think that what we've learned is as we get a little, little bit older, not older, just a little bit older, is that sometimes riffs become they're more heavy and they're they're more they're more groovy if they're just simpler. You know, it's kind of like ACDC, and that's like for the drums. Like I, I get paid to like overplay, just I mean overplay. And so I've learned too sometimes that. Now, especially with this new record, less is more mm-hmm. with the ACDC theory, but I still overplay. I mean, even pulling it back, I still, <laughs> you know. So, yes, um, but it is, it, it helps because, I mean, people, a lot of people, you know, aren't musicians and, you know, two and four is just like, it's all they get, you know. And that's, I mean, that's great because that's really all you need sometimes. Mm-hmm. So, I think that people are now probably trying to learn how to play your tunes well god bless them um i think they are too and and that's awesome we watch them on youtube and a lot of these 
younger cats are trying to like uh, they're, they're playing you know the riffs and and you know singing what Chris is singing and, and doing the drum parts and it's it's very cool I, I saw a group of young Japanese kids uh, that did blind man and that was pretty cool there's some Swedish kids that did blind man and uh, some lonely train covers rain wizard um, there's a couple of, there's boom boom stuff what I like to see is the singers mm -hmm. do you know their own takes and that's really cool because I think when you stop appreciating that I think that's when you got to start worrying you know what I'm saying like uh -huh. we always like what's on YouTube man you know what's like we'll do it after the show like everybody's you know checking their computer to see like what somebody's posted because we're like did they film any of the shows? Anybody put anything up? So, what did they think? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I mean, every unless you're running that, every YouTube thing's just like, <laughs> you know. But it's still cool to watch. True. It. Being on tour and seeing the world means being away from family and friends. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the first thing you do when you return home? Do you have a ritual? I go to my grandmother's and I eat. Really? Yes. She's and anything specific or just? Grandma, cook anything, I'll eat it. Uh, any, anything, any time of night. I mean, usually there's like fried chicken, barbecue chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans, you know, there's, I mean, and a bunch of randomness too, like hot dogs or like fruit salad. There's just oddities, you know? Uh huh. But no, my grandmother is exceptionally well cooked. I think everybody in our band has a really good family. I mean, uh -huh. just, you know, which, uh, you know, all families are crazy. And, you know, after a while, you, you always have your, your, uh, your family feud but like we're very very lucky because we have a really really good you know town we're from that mm -hmm. people support us and we have our uh, grandparents and our mom and dads and you know girlfriends and, and fiancés that have been there and we have the biggest group of friends back home that just support us I mean like it's it's good man like that's one thing that we really look forward to and it's it's hard you know you're out here and it's the only thing that sucks about touring in mm -hmm. Europe and the UK and over here is the phones, man. Really? Yeah, because you got to do Skype, you know, and uh -huh. it just you got to get a Wi-Fi, you know, and you're like, "Hello, yeah, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good." Such how a delay. You? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's the only thing that's hard. But I mean, besides that, like our families, you know, they understand. They, they miss us to death, and but they understand that this is, you know, we're very fortunate and very very you know lucky to be able to, to do this so we have to go out there and and put it you know give it everything we got you know mm -hmm. the first time i met the band on tour for the debut album it impressed me about how down to earth and honest you guys were thanks man. and still are uh the music was more important i had the feeling than the rock and roll lifestyle right now meanwhile you've signed an endorsement deal with evan williams um what sales pitch did you guys get to sign up for that Evan Williams actually put out a digital download on 450,000 Evan Williams bottles. Mm -hmm. What they do is they put a cardboard thing around here mm -hmm. on the neck. And then what it was is basically our picture. And then on the back, what it what you could do is you'd have a confirmation code that you could go online when right. you purchase a bottle. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, you could download that free track and it was blamed on the boom boom. Now, in my opinion, it should have been White Trash Millionaire because obviously that was our first single, but nothing ever lines up in rock and roll time. So it Boom Boom was out before White Trash. It was a demo version. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was really funny because it wasn't really a demo version. We went back in the studio. We had a demo version we were going to put on there and they were like, no, no, save that. They're like, go cut another version. We're like, that's great. Yeah, let's spend some more money. So we had to go cut a demo version, you know, but anyway, that's just craziness but yes it was great um evan williams yeah good company they they've uh really you know i mean it was cool that you know go in a liquor store and see your face on the bottle pretty cool but how did that come about i mean i met you guys you were drinking coca-cola so <laughs> well we're on heroin now so uh <laughs> <laughs> no um well i mean they they approached us and the good thing is is like it's a kentucky company you know we're a kentucky band and um, you know when we first got out here it was prohibition where nobody could drink mm -hmm. and everybody drank you know when we were home but, we, but I guess it was okay because we were younger and it was like being responsible like we a lot of the early stuff we, we were doing is was driving ourselves you know and so I mean it was it was good for us to um, 
to do that. I mean, we really don't drink that much. Mm. I mean, for what we do, we can't drink that much. Right. You know, because it's like it's like it's like a pro football team up there. It's it's really hard. I mean, mm. you got to you got to stay in shape, man. Like I'm 20 pounds overweight now because <laughs> we haven't been doing these type shows. We've been doing like the opening shows in America for like 35 minutes and stuff, but this hour get you. You gotta eat right. You gotta mm-hmm. vegetables, fruit. You gotta drink water, Powerade, Gatorade, whatever you can get. Mm-hmm. But it, it is important. I mean, and you know, it, it's it's cool to, um, you know, to be able to kick back and have a drink with your buddies. I mean, that's mm-hmm. you know, that's what life's about. But are you quite content with staying behind the drums? Now I think of bands like Mr. Big. I've seen a, a, a show of theirs, and um, in the middle of the show, the members actually switch instruments. Could that ever happen to BSC? Yeah, actually, um, about two years ago, Chris would come back and play the drums, and I would go out and play harp mm-hmm. and harmonica, and we had, not the angelic harp, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> harmonica, and uh, we had our our buddy uh, Kevin come up, and he would play guitar, and then our uh, minor engineer, um, when our buddy Jones was doing that, he would come up some nights and play. So it was fun. We would do... Um, I can't remember what we did. Like, I think we did Mustang Sally, one time, and then um, All Right Now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We did All Right Now. I sang that. Could never remember the words. I can't remember <laughs> words to songs. Just saved my life. Uh huh. Can't do it. So you need a monitor with lyrics? Yeah, I need a you know, teleprompter. Uh huh. About some of the tracks on the album, White Trash Millionaire is about the. I'm guessing now is the lifestyle one lives and not forgetting where one comes from. And no matter how rich or famous one becomes, right. All right. Excluding that, what is the most extravagant thing you ever purchased with your earnings? I'm not really a materialistic person. Like I don't really like to like. Well, like the clothes I wear. It doesn't have to be pretty... materialistic, but something that you said, I, okay, if if I was at one point, this is what I'd like to do. A golden you, statue it... of Lemmy. No, I'm just kidding. I, I uh, actually, <laughs> that would be pretty cool though, but I bought a house on the edge of my grandparents' farm. Well, that makes sense. And then I started adding on to it. So that's really, as far as like us, like I don't think we've ever really seen any big money off this because it's just not there. Like the days of Guns N' Roses making like millions of dollars and you know, the you know, Motley Crue, like those days are over because labels there's just there's not enough income off of hard sales of cds Mm -hmm. everybody's downloading things so all that money went out the window that revenue stream so it's um it's different now you gotta save the pennies so um, but a house is something very sensible i think so yeah Yeah, i think so and i think everybody in our band the the money we have made i think they've put it towards something very sensible chris bought a house Mm -hmm. you know john bought a house Ben bought a 1957 Bel Air. <laughs> well, I can't blame him for that. But, you know, hey, dude, that's... But that's probably something he was dreaming about for exactly. 10 and years. Will, and, and the thing is, that thing will never go down in value. Yep. And, you know, he takes he takes better care of it than... His girlfriend. Yes. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's men for you. And it's it's badass, too. I mean, really? It's great, yeah. I oh, can see what it. It's black. Okay. Yeah. He got it from... I think he got it from around Kentucky somewhere. But he, he always wanted a... Uh, a Bel Air, and uh, he's uh, become pretty knowledgeable about the Bel Airs. Like he, I, I would say he'd probably buy a couple more, but oh. I think it's you know I think something like that, you know, you take care of it. It's anything, just like guitars. Like the guys buy guitars. Like if I were to buy vintage drums, you know, I mean stuff like that. Like it never depreciates in value. You just hold on to it, and it becomes, you know, an heirloom. Your great great grandkid gets it one day, you know. So every yeah everybody's been pretty smart with money, but yeah it's a struggle, man. Mm-hmm. I mean people think that we're loaded because we roll around in these things. I mean we're we're very fortunate. Don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. extremely fortunate. But the days of like you know the partying and like you know everybody throwing TVs Kibasi, out the window, yeah, and... that, that shit never <laughs> happens anymore. It might, but it don't happen yeah. on this bus, man. <laughs> we're like TV, man. We're like, we're like it's awesome. <laughs> well, getting back to to Ben, maybe you should hook up with uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Does he like uh, the old cars? Uh, he's muscle cars. Oh yeah, he's into that. He's, he owns, I think, about five or six of them. Like the Challengers and old uh, Chevelles. Yeah, Super B and whatever else, Mustangs and so yeah. on. 
in my blood pretty much about life on the road. Do you ever have family travel with you guys on tour? You know what? It's funny. Uh, actually, we, we haven't had... we Like, if we do short gigs at home, you know, if we go to, like, Arkansas, which is not that far, we go to, like, a weekend trip, like a one-off. Not a tour, but, like, a one-off. We mm-hmm. usually have, you know, like, the dads will come or... Uh, the moms are always welcome. <laughs> they never want to come. They're like, you guys are nasty. You're busted nasty. <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, like friends from home will come. The girlfriends sometimes. We're actually uh, starting, um, let's see, the last part, some of the girlfriends are coming over. They're going to hang with us. So that's going to be nice. I mean, that's what, like, in my blood, too. That's that's the whole thing about that song is um, it's a great opportunity to do what you do, but you do miss family, mm-hmm. you know? So it's gonna it's gonna be nice to have them over here because I mean this is a pretty long tour. This is like it's like seven weeks long. So you guys are going to Spain too, right? No, we were at the first when this tour came about. I think Spain and Portugal were on here, and they somehow didn't you know um, you know make the whole the tour. But um, we're actually doing a tour in uh, in March, a headline tour. So I, I'm, I'm hoping we, we get to Spain and Portugal and, and you know, maybe... Um, we, we've never been to Eastern Europe. We've never been to Poland. Czechoslovakia. To, uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, Slovakia, wherever else. Yeah, Slovakia, Slovenia. We've never been to Russia. We've never been to Russia. Mm-hmm. We just stayed, you know, Western part of Europe. So. Well, it's time to hit the, the yeah. area. So I was always wondering, uh, when are you guys going to do headline acts? Well, you know, we've done headline shows. Um, of course, th- these are, you know, we did the Motorhead tour. Right. And that was just, like, blistering cold. But those were good shows. And, you know, Motorhead has their fans. They're, you know, definitely, you know, for Motorhead. Mm-hmm. But I think we we gained some fans on that tour, you know. Um, we did a tour in the States with Black Label Society with Zach Wilde. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, that was like, like, we learned how to be a good live band. Because, man, dude, people were just like throw stuff at you and like they were like we'll be a black label you know and and by the time we got done with our first song people were like okay kind of looking around like "Ah, okay yeah we'll give them some time yeah so that's kind of how the the motorhead crowd was too you kind of had to prove to them you're a good band and and that's to be accepted man because dude motorhead (laughs) they kill it live oddly enough i'm not a motorhead fan well you know i I was i liked your stuff well thank you thank you I, I wasn't growing up like I, I didn't it wasn't because I didn't like them I just didn't know about them mm-hmm. it's kind of like Pink Floyd like I never like I don't dislike Pink Floyd I just never like I was into like the Beatles Zeppelin mm-hmm. and Errol Smith where like I guess because my dad didn't listen to Pink Floyd a lot right like I didn't grow up to him but as I get older like I start you know listen to him I mean I can name their songs I just I don't know kind of a Zeppelin fan. the osmosis was in there <laughs> such a shame Definitely a socially conscious track. What was the inspiration behind that song? Um, you know, it's just like there's a lot of young girls out there that, you know, need guidance. And, you know, you just, like, when you travel the world, you see things and it just uh, make it just opens your eyes, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, not just outside America. I'm speaking America as well. The world. Know? Yeah, the world over. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just um, very dark song but it you know it's a very realistic song I believe and I think that definitely through the dark you know song it's got a really positive message it's be a good dad be a good father you know talk to your your kids I mean guys too it's not just it's obviously about a female but I mean right you know kids in general need you know, parents they do man because there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of stuff that without proper guidance you know kids can get into that just you know it's not good so it's well, look hard. where you guys are yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look at us, dude. Let me see you shake. The L.A. lifestyle can be a culture shock, and I know what that's like. I've been there. In that song, you were you guys reflecting upon a visit to a strip club by any chance? Uh, we actually wrote that song um, in the practice house in Kentucky. Okay. Yep. So, um, it's probably been more wild shit happened there than L.A., I guarantee you. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean, that song, um, we actually wrote that with uh, my dad, Richard. So, I mean, that it was just one of those songs where, like, the riff came up, mm-hmm. and it was just we started just jamming it. So, we hope that, uh, you know, it becomes a single. Hey, it would be cool to see every, like, you know, album track on the album become a single, you know? Like Nickelback. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 
Well, John, Fred, thanks a lot for uh, having a wonderful chat. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.